Hey, hey, good folks, Calc here, and this is the Let Loop. It can do this. And it can also do this. and it can do a whole world of stuff in between as well. Um, there's plenty of performance videos out there of the Let Loop, but there's not too many that actually go into the inner workings of how this thing, well, actually works. Um, so it's long overdue. I've had mine now for, I think, getting on for about six years, and it's been long overdue. It's been on my list of things to do to make a video for some time. Um, this is actually probably about the 10th attempt to try and make a video on the Let Loop. It's, uh, it's quite a beast. I absolutely love the sound of this thing. It's with me all the time. Whenever I'm playing live, I always use the Let Loop. Um, I always turn to it as well in my production work too. Um, it just sounds amazing and unlike anything else I've got in the room. Um, yeah, it's one of my favorite things of all time. That said, it can be an absolute pig to use. Um, so hopefully this tutorial video, it's gonna be a deep dive, but hopefully um, you'll get some insight onto the workings of the, of the Let Loop, and hopefully that's gonna be useful for you. So without any further ado, let's go for a deep dive into the Let Loop. So before we um, tackle how we actually use the Let Loop, um, let's just take a quick look at the connectivity that we've got on it. So I'm just gonna flip the Let Loop up like so. Um, let's see if we can get this in focus, there we go. So hopefully you can see, we've got a whole load of kind of CV connectivity on the back here. Here's our main outputs. We've got a mix output, which is basically a summed mix of everything coming through the mixer. Dedicated output here for the uh, CASA, which is the, uh, the kick drum and then of course a MIDI input. Um, but alongside that we've got dedicated outs for uh, VCO2, uh, the VCO mix as well, um, and then we've got a whole load of CV and gate control here, including uh, lots of CV outputs, clock outputs, a whole variety of stuff. Uh, you'll see I've got two pots on here. These are not a standard thing. This is a mod um, that we've, uh, well, that I've had done to the Let Loop. Um, I sent it back over to Tony in Milan to get that done. Um, so that's basically a mod to give me fine tuning for the oscillators um, and it's kind of covering a lot of the stuff here but basically we've got access to the sequencer, the gate outs for the different sequences and that sort of thing. Um, if I just pl plop it back down again, let's uh, retune up the focus, here we go. You'll see that we've got a couple of additional points as well. So we've got um, CV input for the VCOs, for the oscillators here. Um, this is set to hertz per volt rather than volt per octave, so do be aware of that. It's on the hertz per volt uh, standard. Um, I've got an audio input here as well to pass any audio I want through uh, the filter. Um, some control input there for the filter as well. And I've got my fantastic uh, envelope shapes here, tap release shapes, and they output their signal as well. So you can integrate this into your setup in a number of ways. If you're a modular kind of guy, it's great. Um, if you are a MIDI kind of guy, um, as I generally am, um, you know, you've got your MIDI input there as well. Um, so yeah, so that's the connectivity. And I guess we should take a look at how we make this little beast work. So here it is, the wonderful Lep Loop all the way from Milan. It's a crazy little box and um, well, I think this video is well overdue. Um, there's quite a few kind of performance videos out there and that sort of thing. Um, but there's not too much in the way sort of explanation of what this box is and what it actually does. Um, I have here the manual and the manual is uh, quite an interesting sort of thing to, to look at. It's not the easiest manual to follow, I must admit. Um, and you know, it's quite, quite difficult, I guess. I do love it though, <laughs> towards the end you get into this world of this crazy dystopian world of the let loop. Um, and yeah, it's, it turns into a bit of a cartoon at the back, which is wonderful. I mean, I absolutely adore the artwork on it. But um, yeah, the manual itself is good, but you know, it's, it's not that easy to follow. 
And it's been written, you know, by two Italian guys as well, translated into English. So maybe, you know, there's a little bit lost in translation there as well. So I figured that it's about time I kind of got, got my uh, ass in gear and basically did a little tutorial on this. So here it is, the Lep Loop. And in the first part of the video, we're going to explore kind of the sound engine, how that side of things works. And then the second part, we're going to go into the, uh, <laughs> into the world of pain that is this sequencer down here. Um, I say world of pain. I mean, it's actually, it's not too bad once you break the back of it. But actually, when you first come to it, you know, you'd be scratching your head for hours thinking, what, what the hell is going on here? And even today when I'm using it, you know, I've had this thing for six years now, I think, something like that, six years. Even today, I'm finding things that I just didn't know it did and uh, uh, wasn't working in the way that I expected it to and all that sort of thing. Um, but to be honest, for me personally, that's kind of one of the real joys about this box. It's just quite unusual. It does unusual things and it does it in unusual ways. So let's dive in and see what we can find out. So first thing is we're going to look at the mixer section here. Um, and I want to just start off the sequencer. In fact, before I start off the sequencer, let's just think about a, a general overview. Um, the let loop is based around four rhythmic sequencers here. And they're attached to various different things. So we have an, a, a sequence here which is dedicated to the casa. The casa is the kick drum. Uh, we have two sequences here, envelope one, envelope two, which are over here. And they uh, basically trigger these envelopes, which are connected to the VCAs, the voltage controlled envelopes here. Uh, voltage controlled amplifiers even, sorry. So, you know, I've, I've got these four rhythmic sequences here. And then I've got this kind of unmarked, weird anomaly of a sequencer here, which is the sample and hold sequencer, which is basically where we load pitch. Now pitch is a weird term when we come to let loop, as we'll find out, but um, that's basically where we program in the pitch. So let's start the sequencer. And you'll see now I've got my kind of little playhead running across these 16 LEDs. So I know where I am in my pattern. I've got these LEDs at the bottom here. And hopefully if the frame rate is good enough on my camera, um, you should be able to see them flashing. If indeed they're not flashing in time, that's probably just down to the frame rate of the camera, to be perfectly honest, but hopefully you can see that. Um, and yeah, so we've got the, the sequencer running now. I've set it to internal clock instead of external clock. Um, I can clock it from MIDI if I want, but we're going to look at this standalone at the moment. So let's go that way. So we're going for the internal clock. I have a BPN control here, but um, let's turn, turn up the CASA. So we get to hear the kick drum. So. CASA is the kick drum circuit, and here you see the trigger triggering the CASA, and these are my controls for the CASA. So here I've got frequency. So basically pitch, I guess. Resonance. Now this isn't resonance in your typical kind of cut-off filter resonance kind of control. I guess this is more like a how long the kick resonates for. Um, and so it's a bit more like a decay but also you can kind of get it into kind of an overdrive by turning that up. So yeah, now a good combination is to kind of work with the frequency and the resonance and find the sound that you want. Now I do really, really like this kick drum sound, especially through a big rig, it sounds great. Um, it's got kind of, I don't know, I guess a bit of an 8080 sort of feel to me, I think. Yeah, anyway, there we go. So that's the frequency and resonance. We've got this here, a distortion. This is like a clipping distortion. If you hear, that gets quite aggressive at that point, especially if we turn up the resonance. So the distortion's there as well. And then the fourth control for the kick drum is this accent here. Now this is like a crossfader between two sequences, between the CASA sequence and the sample and hold sequence. So if I, and the red menu here, using the menu button, go to the red menu. If I press um, the up or down arrow for the CASA sequence, we can see that. If I do the same, press up or down on the sample and hold sequence, you can see there's the sample and hold sequence. So that's a completely different rhythm. So if I bring in the accent here, you can hear now how we've got the kind of the two and we can use the crossfader to kind of accent one. So here, I've got it a bit more to the left, so we're gonna get more of an accent with the CASA sequence. But if I move it over to the right, you know, that sort of changes the, uh, changes the feel there. If we go all the way to the right, the kick drum is now just gonna be played by the sample and hold sequence. So let's go back to the CASA sequence for now. 
Okay, so that's um, a CASA, and we can see how that's attached here to this sequence. Let's open up VCA1 now, Voltage Controlled Amplifier 1. And again, if I'm in the red menu, I just press the up or down arrow, and that'll show me the sequence there. And you see I've just got basically an off, off beat there, a snare kind of beat, if you like. And Voltage Controlled Amplifier is controlled with an attack and release here. So we have VCA1 and an envelope specifically to control VCA1, and it's a two-stage envelope, attack and release. Get it kind of nice and snappy down there, or we can get it nice and long. And if we start to use the attack and the release in unusual ways, they kind of act a bit like a strange clock divided type of thing. Now you see I've got my two backbeat snare sounds, or snare positions for the sequence, but it sounds nothing like that now. So I must admit the noise for me in the let loop running through VCA1 and the envelope here, I just absolutely adore this. It's such a nice kind of musical, tweakable um, envelope shape. And I really enjoy working on this. Okay, now we're getting noise through VCA1. So the noise is being fed into the amplifier and the amplifier is being open and closed with these uh, this attack and this release point here. So the trigger is starting the envelope phase and the noise is always there in the background. It's just the amplifier is opening up and it's being triggered. But I can send other sounds here. Now this little switch section here relates to what is being sent to the amplifiers. At the minute it's switched up here to noise, but if I switch down to VCO1, now I'm going to get VCO1 here, and hopefully I can prove that because here I have the square wave and I switch down here to the triangle wave, and again, I can use the out, um, attack and release to kind of shape that sound. Also, I could decide, actually I want VCO2 instead to come through VCA, Voltage Controlled Amplifier 1, and so I'll switch down here. And now we have VCO2. Now VCO2 is fixed at a sawtooth, uh, I think. Um, and we've got the FM control here as well. So now we've chosen VCO2 to come through VCA1. But generally I'll have that set to noise. Um, I just really like that and obviously this is now kind of part of my rhythmic sort of section of, the, of this as a groove box as a whole. Okay, so there's the switch and it's, I guess it's a bit like a modular synth really, um, except instead of you know using patch cables and that sort of thing, we're basically using switches to route the signal to where we want it to go. Okay, now let's go to VCA2 and bring that volume up. And again, if I press the sequencer here, you can see my sequence in terms of triggers, notes, and again now I have VCA2 controls, the attack and release, to shape that sound. Now what's being fed to VCA2? Well, here's my switch, and I can see voltage controlled filter. This section is passing through to voltage controlled amplifier. We'll explore that in a moment, but if I want to, again I can switch down to have VCO1. Again, triangle, square. Generally, I'll again have this set to VCF, um, so I'm using the VCF sound. I really, again, love this filter, and again, with the interaction with this VCA, this envelope shape, get some really nice stuff there. Okay, so let's think about what's kind of feeding the filter then, and that's this section here, VCF in. Again, I can switch to noise. So you can use that to get some quite interesting kind of rhythmic stuff going on. Of course the noise is passing through the filter. I could take the cutoff right down and just open the filter right up and just have the raw sound coming through. 
or of course I can use the modulation here to say okay modulate or move this cutoff control with a source and at this point we've set to envelope 2 we'll come to that again in a moment but we want, we're looking at this section here so VCF in so what is feeding the filter well I've got noise I've got the VCO mix which is up here we'll come to that in a moment but I also can send the CASA through the kick drum so you can kind of do all kinds of unusual things with the with the kind of the three if you like main sound sources the CASA the noise um, and the oscillators. Let's go back up to VCO mix now. Let's bring it down a bit. So VCO mix is now feeding through the filter. So VCO mix is this section here. And I have VCO2, VCO1, or anywhere in between. Now you can hear the oscillators are slightly out of tune. Well, quite a bit out of tune now. So let's just open up the release a bit so I've got a bit more length of the note to play with to tune them up and Now one thing I will say about the oscillators in the left loop these frequency controls here are really quite coarse controls so actually um I'm in a very pri privileged position because I now can class Tony, Tony Lights, who makes the let loop as one of my mates, um, and we speak quite regularly, and I asked him if he'd put on a mod for me, which he's kindly done, which is a fine tune control for the two oscillators here. And that for me is a bit of a game changer because if you're playing live and you want to get things nice in tune, it's an, it can be an absolute nightmare, it really can. And I've been caught out on a couple of gigs, to be honest, with this just getting slightly knocked out of tune and that sort of thing. So these fine tune pots are really useful for me, but they're not as a standard on the let loop. So, you know, you do have to just get used to kind of using these two frequency controls. So, crossfader, VCO1, VCO2. Um, we also have a ring modulator. So this is kind of some indifference of the two oscillators. Now they're a bit in tune, let's just knock them out a bit. So you can hear that start to play around. So the ring modulator is quite nice as well. Let's go back to mix though. Great, okay. Uh, now, what do we have? Well, I mentioned a couple of times we've got a square wave and a triangle wave for VCO1. VCO2, as I say, I think is fixed as a sawtooth. But then we've got this control here, the FM amount. Now, this is cross modulation between oscillator 1 and 2. And it comes out of the VCO2 output. But I believe it's actually VCO1 being um, frequency modulated by VCO2. Now, if I start to play around with the tuning again, get some really crazy sounds out of this, and this is one of my favorite things. You can just get a really nice sort of point there where you just get some really, really unusual, wacky sounds out of it. Now, this frequency modulation control has three destinations, or sources I should say, sorry. VCO1, so cross modulation between them. I could also say, let's use envelope one. So every time envelope one is triggered, we're basically gonna apply this envelope shape to the pitch. So that can be interesting as well. And also we've got the LFO. Here's my LFO section. So we have an amount, speed. Doesn't go into super audio rates, but it's still, you know, it's usable. And we have an offset. So this is basically setting the zero point, if you like, the cross through point for that LFO. And I have different shapes. I have a sine wave, a triangle, uh, sorry, a square there and then a triangle. So that can be quite interesting as well. Generally, again, for me personally, I like to keep this set to the cross modulation part. I just genuinely love that. Really nice. 
if I just add a little bit of reverb, which isn't going to be recorded, so I'm not going to do that. Oh well, <laughs> should have set my uh, audio track up a bit better. Oh, well, never mind. So, oh wow, back in tune. Nice. Okay, so that's kind of, um, if you like, the sound routing of what we've got going on with the let loop. Uh, we've got our routing switches here, uh, the voltage control filter, the filter section here can receive from the oscillators and of course with the oscillators we've got our different sort of uh, waveform choice here and then this all singing, all dancing frequency modulation here, the crossfader and the ring modulation. So that's kind of, if you like, the sound sources and how they all interact is kind of where it gets really quite interesting. Um, right, okay, so we've explored kind of the sound routings here but how do we kind of control these various different devices? Well, let's switch the sequencer back on. Let's look at the sequencer first of all. Now, VCA2 here being sent a signal from the VCF, which in turn is the oscillators passing through the filter. And of course we're getting sort of pitch here. Let's go to VCO1 for the moment. Now we're getting a pitch signal here and that's because I'm set to my sequencer. If I switch to sample and hold, now it's using the LFO because that's basically what's triggering the sample and hold. But if I switch to noise and put an amount on there, and maybe speed, now you can hear it's kind of going random now. And that's because we've got the white noise signal controlling the oscillator pitch and that's basically very much a random sample and hold feature. If I go to LFO, okay at the minute no LFO, let's turn it on, get an amount. Get the offset higher, there we go going a bit out of the audio range there with it in terms of it's a bit too low to hear but now I'm using the square wave and now that's how it was what's controlling the oscillator we can go to a, to a sign of course so we've got this kind of nice wobble now if I bring in the crossfader VCO2 is still getting its signal from the sequencer so we're still getting the pitch there but if I move that to LFO we get the same kind of sound Again, I can move back to the sequencer at any time. So you see, I've got kind of lots of different ways of routing the control for these oscillators by these switches. I've also got a switch down here as well. And that's giving me a, a negative envelope one at the minute. Let's go to envelope one, it'd be a bit easier to hear. So now we're using the attack release here to basically shape the pitch signal. If we go to envelope 2, we can use that as well. And if I switch all the, to the way to the end here, now I've got a negative version of envelope 1. Again, generally when I'm working, I'll keep it set to sequence here. And that's now going to take its pitch from the sequencer down here. Now we have similar controls here for the cutoff um, for the filter. So I can say, okay, this cutoff modulation, i.e., the control, let's it's currently set to envelope two. So we can use that envelope to shape the how much the cutoff opens. Equally, I could say, okay, use envelope one. That's kind of nice to get some interesting kind of rhythmic stuff out. So now I have my kind of sequence being controlled by uh, the, the oscillator is being controlled by the sequencer, the pitch sequencer, but the sound is being allowed through the filter using envelope one, and that's feeding into envelope two. So we're kind of using both envelopes there to kind of play around with the rhythm. So we 
can get some interesting stuff with that as well. Okay, um, once again, negative, uh, envelope one. Interesting. I can also send the sequence pitch data to the cutoff. Now, unless you're using large pitch jumps, it's not going to make that much of a difference. Let's just... Yeah, it's quite difficult to get that to kind of work properly. Um, I guess you just need huge pitch jumps, and that's going to basically give this more, a, more of an extreme, say, open, open, close like this. Um, likewise, I can use the sample and hold as well. And again, this is giving it a random signal, or I can send the LFO. For the resonance has also got the ability to receive um, modulation control of the resonance. Um, and we can use envelope 2, for example. So we can, you know, use that way as well. The resonance, by the way, yeah, it sucks a bit of the bottom end out of the um, filter. So do be aware of that, and it does go into self-oscillation self quite quickly. Again, it's quite an interesting filter to play and work with. Generally, again, I keep mine set to envelope 2 there. And don't I don't really use the resonance too much. I do like the kind of the low-pass cutoff just as it is without too much of a resonant peak on there. I do find it does suck a, quite a bit of the bass out. Let's yeah, you can see it does suck quite a bit of the bass out there. Okay, so we're kind of getting there now with our routings. Um, one thing to mention, the FM control here. Which I do genuinely love. What's quite interesting is when you start to have an interaction between the um, frequency modulation, cross modulation of oscillator VCO2 into VCO1, and then maybe I'll start to apply some envelope to shape the pitch here, so we can get even more gnarly and weird sounds from that. I really take it off into another planet with this. So using the pitch, or you know, controlling the pitch of this oscillator whilst it's frequency modulating would be quite interesting. Let's go to LFO. Bit less kind of noticeable. There we go. So we've kind of looked at kind of all of the routing stuff on the top now. Oh, one thing I haven't mentioned is that we have a dedicated volt uh, voltage controlled frequency uh, filter output. Voltage controlled filter output, I should say. Yeah, here it is. And this is basically just taking this filter sound and outputting it here. So it's not running through the VCA at this point. So that's kind of interesting now, because if I switch down to just hearing VCO1 out of VCA2, we're actually increasing the amount of sounds that we can get out. So we've got the CASA. VCA1 is being fed by the noise. VCA2 is just hearing VCO1 on its own. And VCF is being fed by the mix. In essence, this cross-modulated VCO2 signal. So the VCF volume is quite useful. Often I will just stick with the VCA2 as my main kind of, let's say, synth output though. Okay, right. Now I think it's probably time that we start to look at this wonderful, awkward bastard of a sequencer underneath. <laughs> let's, uh, let's crack on and see what we can do. So the sequencer, I'm going to make no bones about it. This is 
by far and away the most awkward part of the let loop. The kind of the, the, the architecture, the routing of the sound and all that sort of stuff is pretty straightforward actually when you start to um, you know sort of explore the top panel but the sequencer is still an enigma. So um, let me go to an empty pattern here. Let's just take everything down apart from the cast. Now um, the next section we're going to look at how we program uh, the sequencer up but I wanted to just explore a very um, important feature about the sequencer as a whole. Now here we've got these four track buttons and in the red menu I can use the up and down arrows to move between these different tracks. These are essentially patterns if you like inside the let loop and each one of those patterns is 16 steps long as we've got our LEDs up here. Now in the red menu if I press and hold the shift one button and I then can change the length of the sequence. So here I've now made this particular pattern an eight step sequence. Um, you can see there it's only eight steps. But if I go beyond 16, okay, now you'll see and my tracks both one and two are lit. And if I try and move to the next track, um, I jump straight to three between one and three. And basically because I've gone over the track length of 16 steps, I'm now kind of halving how many uh, available patterns are to me. So actually I could have four 16 uh, tracks if you like. I could have um, I could have two up to 32 or I could have one that is 64 steps. And again in the red menu we change the track length by pressing shift one and then the up and down arrow on the appropriate track here to either elongate or indeed make the sequence shorter. Right, let's start off the sequencer. Now, these are these lights are flashing because there's sequence data in there. There we go. I just have to press the up and down arrows to see that. But once I've pressed it once, if I press it a second time, it will shift track. And this happens in the red menu. There we go. So now I've cleared all of those patterns there. Now, the menu button here accesses four different menus, but generally you will only tap through two. These are kind of like the two main ones. The red one, which is kind of like, well, it's I, this is the one where you can choose different tracks and, you know, kind of choose the different pattern parts that you've got. The green one is for programming. So let's first of all, um, yeah, let's program up a kick drum. So CASA is now empty, okay? And we're in the green menu, so now I can use the up and down arrows to find the point at which I want to place a step. So here it is on step one. Let's go step one, five, nine, and 12. Actually, go on, let's, let's treat ourselves to one on 13 as well. So you can see now we've very quickly programmed that in. If I go back to the beginning of the sequence and press and hold shift one, this button here, shift one, I can put steps in all the way across. Um, if I go back to the beginning and press shift two, I can clear them. So shift one adds a step, shift two clears it. Let's go back and let's put in that uh, rhythm again. Okay, so we've got a rhythm there, it's kind of all right. If I want to clear it very quickly, I can press shift one and two together and that just clears it out. But let's go back in and put a four on the floor sound, there we go. So that's how you program the sequence. Let's go to envelope two now. And it seems I have something on there. So let's just make some off beats. Of course, we can't hear it because the volume's down. But let's now, this, this is a really unusual thing for the let loop. And I've spoken to Tony and uh, Giovanni about this, and there is a reason for it. Let's look at the CASA um, sequence. I'm on basically the first. Um, first step of a beat. Go to envelope two, oh, sorry, envelope one, this one here. And there it is. And that's on the off beat, but it's sounding at the same time. Now, this is a really weird thing about the let loop. When you change a pattern, won't um, kind of just keep in phase. It won't keep it keep its timing. You've got to reset the phase. And again, you do this on the red menu. 
press shift one, oh, sorry, shift two, not shift one, shift two and press button one. Now that resets the clock. That basically resets and starts the clock from the beginning and obviously you see everything's gone into its right place there. So let me just move out again. You see now I've just quickly changed that pattern and it's jumped out again. So shift two, press one, and that brings it all back in nice and tight. Um, a couple of other things as well. So for example, if I'm using, um, there we go. It's not always, you don't always get it wrong, but sometimes you do. Um, now, if I'm using an external device now, and using my MIDI coming in, I can do this, I can reset this while the MIDI clock is still happening, and I press Shift 2 and press number 5. And that will basically wait for the MIDI clock and will play the appropriate, you know, it will reset the phase at the appropriate point with the internal MIDI clock coming in. I have another option here, if I press Shift 2 and hold down number 10, that's just resetting the clock on every sort of pulse. So you can kind of use that as a little bit of a, almost like a fill. Okay, now let's explore envelope two. So at the minute I've got an empty sequence here, so I'm gonna go green, green menu, and I'm gonna put some, let's see, I'm gonna put in these steps in this really basic way. So just on the beat and eighth beat. Let's bring up the VCA2. And again, now you can, you can see that being triggered with um, the sequence. But of course we're getting pitch now. Let's uh, go back to VCF, there we go. Okay, so we're getting pitch data from the sequence, sequence section here, and that's playing the pitch of the oscillators. Now, the pitch data is held here on this track. And if I go to the red menu, now you can see I've got various different ways of controlling this. So here we've got a free running sequencer. Now, let me just stop it for a second. Each one of these steps has a stored pitch value in there. That's stored into a capacitor, um, a little electronic component that holds a charge. Now over time, that capacitor releases the charge and the pitch degrades and basically lowers down. That's another really, well, I would say, absolute secret weapon of the let loop. It just gives it this completely unusual and weird sound. If you're wanting something that you can, you know, play with nice pristine kind of perfect tuning, pristine melodies, all that sort of thing, let loop isn't. But if you want something that's going to give you lots of great sounds, great bass lines actually, you know, it really is nice. But, you know, where pitch is kind of wonky sort of aspect to things, then the let loop is your friend. But let's just explore what we've got. So I'm going to trigger this again. Now you can see on my pitch sequencer, this is free running. If I press up, now you see it's being triggered, and I believe in this instance, I'm just gonna just double check in the manual here, but I'm pretty certain that this now is the pitch sequencer, but it's being advanced every time envelope, envelope two plays a trigger. Okay. Now if I do go to this next set here, when we go to three, Okay, that's running, and that is basically going to reset every time there's a sample and hold trigger. So it's going to jump back to the beginning every time there's a sample and hold trigger. At the minute there isn't one. So let me go to my sample and hold track, and let's say, okay, let's put a step in there. Now let's go back, and you'll see, every time the sample and hold triggers, it's going to reset the pitch sequencer here. It's going to jump it back to the beginning. Let's change that up, so let's move this here. Let's get rid of that one, let's put it, change it there. So now, let's see. Let's restart the clock and we should, there we go, that's what I wanted. So basically now, there's a step there. Now let's 
go back to sample and hold, put another step on. Ah, here we go, I've gone to a place where we've, we've got a step on each one. And of course now, it's only going to get as far as the first step on the sample and hold sequencer. It's just not being able to advance because the sample and hold is resetting it all the time. Let's go and change that. Now it's not gonna get reset at all. So go back again, let's put a couple of points on there. see now there are two sample and hold steps and that's resetting the sequencer every time it hits one of those steps. Now if I press in the red menu again and we go now to this fourth method, basically what we're going to do now is it's going to advance with every envelope 2 trigger but every time we reach the end of this sequence for envelope 2 it's going to reset. So we've got a number of different ways of advancing the pitch. If we go back to this one, that's just free running and moving. Go to this one, is waiting for envelope two, and it's just advancing with each one. If we go to this one, oh, I beg your pardon, let's go to this one. Now it's gonna reset the pitch every time sample and hold sends a trigger in. So we can get different kind of rhythmic stuff going on, different pitch stuff going on. And then finally, number four is basically just going to reset every time this sequence ends. So it's going to advance with the sequencer, but when it reaches the end of this sequence, it's going to jump back. So that's quite an important aspect of how the pitch works. Okay, now I'm going to stop the, uh, the clock again now here, uh, stop the uh, let loop, and let's take a look at how we can actually program in pitch. So let's think about how we could do this. Um, I will go to envelope two. Let's just change this up a bit. So let's just go for four notes on envelope two. Okay, so I've got four notes there. And let's just start it off. So let's go to version four here. So it's going to advance the pitch every time there's an envelope 2 trigger, but when envelope 2 reaches the end of its sequence at the end here, it's going to reset the pitch sequence as well. So that means I've got four notes here that I can kind of program in and they will play with envelope 2. So let's go to our pitch control here and actually let's just stop the sequence. I'm going to bring up VCF now. Now the reason I've done that is that I want to be able to hear as I'm programming the thing. Now we're doing this with the sequencer stopped. We'll look at ways that we can do it with the sequencer running as well. But for now, let's stick with the sequencer stopped. Now if you can hear, that pitch is very, very slowly degrading over time. It takes a long time actually, but it's, that's kind of part of the magic of what the let loop does, to be honest, this kind of weird pitch interaction that is going on. But, right, let's program up. So, we're in the green menu, okay? We can use the up and down arrows to choose the pitch. And I can use shift one and two to change that pitch. So I've now got four octaves. Well, four octave notes. Maybe let's change this, this last note to the fifth. Okay, now let's bring that down. I've programmed it up now. Let's put the clock back on. Now, hopefully you can see envelope two is advancing that pitch but resetting the clock at the end of the envelope two sequence. So I've got these four notes there and I've programmed those up. Now, watch what happens if I now go to envelope two here and add an extra note. Let's see that. So 
from that we're advancing onto the fifth note before the sequence ends because we've got five triggers on here sequence resets it and then we come back so let's say I want to tune up or play this uh, fifth note in a different way so stop the sequencer just turn up the, um, the the oscillators running through the filter and just go to green menu So, happy enough with that note. Okay, go back to the clock here. There we go. So you can program this up. Now watch what happens if I then go to my red menu and change the way that the uh, pitch sequencer advances. I've got my five notes still there, but then I've got all these extra notes that you know I haven't programmed up there. I'll move to this one. Oh, sorry, this one. Now it's just advancing with every envelope two step and that's just going to cycle in its own kind of natural way. When it hits the 16th note or 16th point, it'll go back to the beginning. We'll go to this one. Oh, keep doing that. See, this is how it gets awkward down here to program all these different buttons to play with. Let's go to this track now. This is resetting with the sample and hold. And let's go back to where we were. That was the one. There we go. Okay, so what else do we have? Well, um, the green menu is pretty much that. It's just entering the notes using shift one, removing notes with shift two, and advancing the sequencer to where you want it to be using these arrows here. But the red menu has got a couple of things. We've all already looked at the kind of the reset phase, so you can just press shift two and number one, and that's going to reset the clock. Same again, we can we do it with shift 10, that's always resetting the clock. Or if I'm receiving external clock, um, I can uh, use number five to reset um, alongside the external clock there. Um, but we have a couple of other menus as well. Let's bring... So if I press and hold for a second, we go into the clear menu now. And we've got kind of a crib sheet here, which is kind of useful. But here is where I can save and store my work. So let's say I want to save this sequence. If I press Shift 1 and 2 together in the clear menu, I'm now faced with five LEDs here and five LEDs here as well. And basically, they are my save points. And I have five buttons, one, two, three, four, five. So these five LEDs of one, two, three, three, four, five here. Five LEDs here, one, two, three, four, five. Um, and so let's say I want to save it into this position number 12. So I'll press Shift 1 and 2 together. This is the first LED on the second batch, so that's number 6 here. I've now saved it in there. If I want to load a track, press Shift 2, the same kind of menu appears, and this time I'm going to load up this first one here. And this was my sequence that I had before, but if we want to go back to what we just created, hold down Shift 2, press number 6, which is relating to this LED here. So there it is. Now I can also use the menu to access 16 different banks of 10 presets or saved points. It's a huge, huge amount of saving capability on here. So really powerful stuff. Okay, so let's look at some of the other menu features that we've got here. So the clear menu, actually let's just reset the uh, camera so I don't run out of space. So let's come back to that in a second and then we'll look at the uh, additional menus. So, so far we've explored the red menu and the green menu. Red menu to basically choose our different uh, sequences that are programmed in. Green menu to program up those sequences. So we can use the up and down arrows to program in our points. And actually you do get quite quick with that as well. 
Um, we look very briefly then at the clear menu as well. So if I press and hold the menu button for a second, the LED will turn off and now we're into the clear menu and that's called the play menu here. We saw it again, if I press shift one and two together, I can save, if I press shift two on its own, I can load. Um, but equally in this menu, I've got some interesting things that I can do with the clock. So let's go and uh, fire things off. Right, let's just go with the synth for the moment. Okay, let's look at the sequence. There it is, let's just restart from the beginning. There we go. So that's the sequence, let's go to the clear menu. Now, if I press Shift 1, and then up on envelope 2's track here, I can increase the clock speed. I can go really slow, increase it to normal, or well, that's quite slow. Again, if we listen to context. I think we're back to normal there now. But we're out of phase, of course, so if I press, go to the, green, uh, the, the red menu, press Shift 2, there we go, we're back where we were. So the clear menu allows me to basically set clock divisions. Let's look at this on the hi-hat part here as well. Let's just program in a, a step on that first point. Okay, that's cool. Now if I go to the clear menu, press Shift 1 and then up. Really slow now. So you can use the clock divisions here to get some quite interesting kind of stuff going on. Again, don't forget if you need to, shift two in the red menu plus button one resets the clock. Now, this is interesting. If I press shift one and then hold the up arrow for about, I think it's three seconds. Now we get triplets. So shift one plus the up arrow for three seconds puts you into triplets mode. And now I have clock divisions based around triplets. Go kind of crazy with that. Now maybe if I want to go back to sort of straight non-triplet kind of rhythms, press shift one and hold it. Press the down arrow for three seconds. There we go. And again, we've got a fast clock division there, so let's go back. So, the clear menu allows you to save and load your tracks, but equally allows you to apply clock divisions to the different tracks. Okay, now the last menu that we need to explore is the yellow menu. And you press and hold the menu button for three seconds and it goes yellow. Well, I would say that's perhaps more of a kind of a red, yellow combo. Orange, let's say. Um, but this is quite an interesting one as well. Now, you can see here envelope one is actually playing correctly here um, and is on the beat. If I look at the Casa track, you'll find that that's the same as well. But I can use the up and down arrows in the yellow menu to knock things a step out. So it's like a nudge. Now you see, I've, I've pressed the envelope one nudge twice, and now it's on the offbeat. If I go back to my red menu and bring it all back into phase, there you go. So that can be quite handy if you want to just knock things out a little bit. Now if I press shift one and do that, I can actually advance it by um, the pulse per quarter notes. And I think we've got 24 pulse per quarter notes. So I can actually knock the sequence really off kilter. It's quite interesting. And you could probably get it back in, but you can just get this kind of nice kind of little wonk there. bring it all back in. So that's one thing we can do again on the yellow menu. 
and I'm just going to have to quickly look at my notes here just to remind myself of some of the other things that we've got for the yellow menu. Okay, so yeah, our fine nudge and nudge off the grid. Aha, of course. Um, let me now put some extra notes here on envelope two. Okay, so I've just put some extra notes on there, and the reason for that doing that is I'm going to go to the yellow menu, and this time I'm going to use Shift 2, and I'm going to use the up arrow, and now we're skipping steps. And you can add some really interesting, can add some really interesting variation to the, the tracks you're working on by doing it this way. We've just got a couple of notes really in the sequence that you can do a heck of a lot with them and eventually you can get it so that the sequencer will run backwards and again we can do this with the uh, sequencer track as well see so the envelope is running backwards sequence is running forward I go to my yellow menu, shift two. Now that's jumping around with the pitch data on the sample and hold sequencer. And again, I can eventually get it so that I can run backwards. There you go. So now my pitch data is running backwards. Envelope two is running backwards. Maybe I want to bring that forwards. So now you can see my envelope 2 rhythm is running forwards, my pitch data on the sample and hold sequencer is running backwards. So you get some interesting things there. Equally actually I should mention on the, on the pitch sequencer I have the clock divide again and I can add triplets onto there. So. You can hear now this is in straight time for the pitch is in triplets. So let's now bring that back. So we go shift two. stuff there. Again, if I want to go back into straights, hold it down for a second. There we go. Right, let's go to different, get a different sequence running now. Maybe I want to load in one, so I'll go to the clear menu, shift two, and then. And there, the sequence is so super low on the pitch, it sounds terrible, but. Okay, so really, I think I'm going to finish up now. We've kind of looked at every little element. Oh, apart from one thing. Um, yeah, let's look at this next section. And this, I guess, is probably like the sort of the, the, the secret tip uh, for using Let Loop. We've got this fantastic switch here. So, okay, I think it's time to reset cameras again and then I'll show you how we can actually program in pitch sequence live with the let loop and this is where the let loop can just go off on its own little journey and its own little life so let's let's see what we can do there this section we're going to look how we can program the pitch into let loop whilst it's running before we saw how i had to open up the filter here 
go to my green track and then actually physically program in each of these steps using the shift one and shift two to go down so you know that's how we can program in a sequence and then save it and you've always got that sequence to come back to but of course you know with something like this you want to really just get it running and then start to play with it so let's bring back this first sequence okay so we've got it running at the minute and we're sending the pitch data via the sequence switch here but I'm going to switch this one over to sample and hold just first of all I'm going to turn down all of the controls for the LFO that'll become reason why in a minute switch it over to LFO here but let's go to the sample and hold section now now this is actually receiving its pitch data this track is receiving its pitch data when it's set to sample and hold from the sample and hold section down here if I switch oscillator 1 to be sequencer we're just going to hear the recorded pitch sequence but now I have sample and hold here and I can use the offset here to pitch up and tune VCO2. There it is. I could even use the LFO as part of it. Now the LFO is basically make the pitch run up and down, but that's actually recording into the sample and hold. We're not recording into it being played by the sample and hold sequence. So if I hit record, go back to the sequence here now. The LFO is recording into the sequencer. So by using the record button here, we're loading up or charging the capacitors with new information. Now let's go back to sample and hold here. Let's take the rate off and the amount all the way down and use the offset here to find the pitch I want. going to go for that pitch switch over to the sequence now we're still listening to the recorded sequence that we last recorded in to the capacitors but now I've set the value here and it's just a single note so if I hit record it's going to pass over and now it's going to take this offset value and just load that pitch data into the sequencer here when I switch back to loop now we've recorded it in it's safe now if I go back to sample and hold now, use the offsets, I'm using the crossfade in the middle here, this mixer, I can hear VCO1 playing the sequence, so the original note, VCO2 is now being chosen by the pitch control here. So we'll go for an octave, switch back to sequence here now, and now we can just load in um, this octave sound into one of the capacitors on the sequencer. There we go. Same again, move back to here. Go for a minor third. And then back to sequence here. We can carry on doing that as, as long as we want. So I'll just go back to the uh, sample and hold here again. And of course my sequencer, my pitch sequencer, is running on this fourth way, so it's resetting after envelope, every envelope two. But if we go now to, so we have it free running, or after every envelope two here now, every envelope two trigger, I have more space to record longer patterns in.
So that's how we can use the record option here and the LFO being stopped but use the offset to choose the pitch. So where the LFO would start from if it was running, we can use that to basically be a pitch control and then we can load in the pitch that we want into the sequencer. So, there we go. That's a good look at the LEP loop. I mean, it's quite a long video as I, ex as I expected it to be. Um, but hopefully, you know, if you've made it through to the end here, you'll have picked up a little bit more about what this box does and, and how it can be used. I mean, I, it is genuinely nothing like anything I've got in my synth collection. It's just got its own sound, its own little way about it. Yeah, the first time I think I heard about the Let Loop was um, actually I'd watched a video by a producer guy called Kink, uh, a guy from Bulgaria, Strahil, who actually has also become a friend. Um, but yeah, he was talking about the um, the Let Loop as part of his live setup, and he was talking about the way that the capacitors charge and then discharge and the sound degrades over time. And I thought, well, that sounds fascinating. Um, I think Kink described it as uh, his secret weapon, um, which I think kind of makes a lot of sense. Really, it is quite a secret weapon. Um, in, you know, when, when you're using it, it sounds nothing like anything else, at least, anyway. And then, of course, the FM control here as well. Now, the LEP loop is great as a standalone device. But equally, it works really nicely when combined with other devices as well. Um, I often use my um, Novation circuit to work with the LEP loop. And actually, you can control the oscillators via a MIDI signal. In fact, I can quickly show you that on the yellow menu, if you press Shift 1 and 2 together, you get a kind of a weird MIDI page. And I believe if you press this 5 and 10, you can choose your MIDI channel, including an omni channel, so I'll work on all of them, but generally I keep it set here and this means that the uh, channel 16 is going to deal with all the rhythmic parts but actually the pitch data um, and the envelope 2 trigger data comes from MIDI channel 1. So my circuit synth 1 output on the sequencer is basically controlling my um, oscillators. Anyway, there we go. That's the let loop, and I hope it's been interesting for you to watch. And I'm going to be quite honest, I can't believe I managed to get through the whole video. Okay, there are a few edit points, <laughs> but yeah. And this is probably about the tenth time I've tried to make this video. So, hopefully, I can put this one to rest now, and just get on and play with it. The lab loop.